make a hand in welcoming Linda to the stage. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Kalle. Wow. So today's topic is going to be shipwreck of my own wanderings. And as you guys heard, uh, let's put this on. Uh, yes. Give a big mega hand for him. Wow. <laughs> okay, here we go. So my name is Linda. Uh, I'm a children's book author. I'm an illustrator. I'm a mediocre programmer I'm a, and I'm a business school dropout and usually I talk about technology, technology education, uh, the thing that I'm really really excited about right now is artificial intelligence and uh, neural networks but today I'm going to have to talk about myself and my own journey which makes me super self-conscious. Uh, the fact is that I don't consider myself to be very successful at what I do. Uh, I just had a bag of candies for dinner uh, I, today I discovered that I haven't paid like nearly enough uh, employee taxes for the year. I, I I haven't been home in a week, and my like I, I don't have any clothes anymore, <laughs> more like uh, clean than these ones. So I'd say that what I wish that this talk will give you is some ideas and inspiration on on how how to manage your life as a shipwreck of your own wanderings. Um, my story starts from pretty much the beginning. Um, I never knew what I wanted to be when I was a little girl. I, I had ideas and I had like answers that I would give when people would ask me, but I, I never had a clear passion that this is what I do when I grow up. And I think no technology person can ever give a presentation without quoting even one Steve Jobs. And this is my quote, and it's my favorite quote from Jobs. He, he says that a lot of people in the technology industry has, have very linear experiences of life, and thus they, they design uh, very linear experiences and products. And you need different kinds of dots to connect in order to make sense of your life and thus provide value for other people. And I would sort of tie this idea into the idea of a constellation, stars on the sky. And you know how there's no geographic or no physical or no, uh, no natural science related reason why we humans see constellations on the, si uh, on the, on the sky. It's, it's mostly storytellers. It's, it's storytellers who came up with constellations, the idea that let's connect the dots on the sky. And it didn't really change the night sky but it gave us humans a perception of the, of the like, invisible and, and of all of those scattered stars across the sea. And it made us understand the night sky a little bit better. And I think careers nowadays, they are not linear anymore. They are not horizontal anymore. So you can't really tell in advance what's going to happen for you in your career. Rather, I would see my career as a constellation, different kinds of stars that connect in different kinds of ways. And one of the exciting things, I think, is you'll see constellations in different ways uh, if you're on the north side of the planet or the south side of the planet. We have different names for them and different myths and stories. In Finland, we call this Otava. Uh, somewhere else, it's called something else. And I think it's also a beautiful narrative into what kind of options and opinions we see for our future, especially as a student. And the most beautiful thing about this whole thing is that you can only connect the dots looking backwards. That's also a Steve Jobs quote. And you can only make sense of a constellation after you've finished collecting the dots. So with this in mind, I wanted to give you five little stars from my personal constellation that is not finished yet, but sort of personal stories of who, how I became who I am today and maybe a direction where I'm going next. And the first story starts with startups. So I'm definitely not a startup CEO. My company is a medium-sized or even a small company that employs one person and, and maybe a few others every now and then when I have enough cash in the bank. But I wouldn't be doing the things I do today unless I got acquainted with the, the startup scene. So this was roughly, uh, I'd say, six or seven years ago. Uh, when the startup scene of Finland was a joke. <laughs> it was a bunch of people who had nothing else to do in their lives and who were geeky and weird and, and definitely not the glamorous type of people. And we had the first um, startup evening, or Krista organized the first startup evening in, in, in Design Factory. And I actually found from Jaiku like a 
tweet or like yaiku that I had made back in the day. So, so this is actually the service that made Petteri Koponen and Yuri Engström famous because it got sold to Google and it was kind of the first splashy, like consumer facing product that uh, the modern startup scene developed. So I, I wrote something like, uh, Eka viikko kun koulu ja työ tuntuu vaikealta yhdistää startup evening voi mennä nuokkuessa, which is roughly the first evening that it feels like work and life is hard to combine and it might be like sleepy time at the startup evening. Well, it wasn't. I met so many people who inspired me and I think Krista drafted me to design the next Alta ES or AES, what, like it was called back in the day, website. Uh, right back then I had never done a website before, but Krista was very convincing. I said, yes, you need to do this. And this whole thing took me on a whirlwind tour of uh, different projects and people and experiences. I got to study in Stanford University. I got to uh, visit Y Combinator. I got to pitch on stage at Slush. Uh, and it really shaped me into the way I am today. Because I think the most beautiful thing about startups and startup entrepreneurs is not the growth, it's not the scale, it's the people and their optimism. My experience, startup entrepreneurs see colors a little bit uh, brighter and, and for them the sky is a little bit higher and, and they gave me my ambition and, and my worldview. I also organized the first Silicon Valley trip or the second Silicon Valley trip for the students and I want to show you a few slides for the prep material that we prepared because one thing you need to understand that, that already now all of you know so so much more than we did back in our days because the startup scene was so nascent, it was so non-existent that we actually needed to tell each other who Mark Zuckerberg is or, or <laughs> like, uh, who is Eric Ries and educate one another about these things. And, and I'd say that you are in a position where you already have so much more knowledge than we did back in our days. And we needed to educate each other about like success stories in the Finnish startup scene. And and Jaiku uh, Doppler, Sulake, Trema, Afsekure, Assasho. You might recognize some of these names, but you see that there's so many uh, companies that already shape uh, the startup ecosystem of today that are missing from that chart. And that's because all of that has happened in the past six to seven years. And all of you guys have been or will be a part of that change. So that's kind of what I took from the startup scene. Um, I think the most important thing that you guys are, I, I would love, I, I just turned 30, so I'm allowed to be a little bit nostalgic at this point. <laughs> Your early 20s are so precious. You have all of this time and all of this freedom to look at every single opportunity out there and, and explore and experiment and try out new things. And the society might tell you that, oh, you chose wrong and you need to finish your master's degree, but don't listen to them and <laughs> try out new things because eventually you will become old, <laughs> like all of us who do, and you will become have more responsibility and it will just get harder and harder and the window of op opportunity will be smaller and smaller. It doesn't mean that those of you who are over 30 in the room, like that you're doomed, no way. Like some of the most amazing people I know never knew what they would end up doing when they were 30. But use your 20s well and try out new things. So the second story I wanted to tell you today is about finding your passion. This is an advice I bet you've heard a lot of times, like just follow your passion and the business will come along and, and you can make your career around your passion. Well, I'm not entirely sure about that. How many here know exactly what your passion is? Raise of hands. Yeah, and, and this is the exact thing that I'm explaining about. You guys are so lucky and I consider myself to be very lucky that I found the thing that I really cared about pretty young and I, I consider it to be a luck, not, <laughs> not of talent or anything like that. But giving advice to someone that follow your passion who has no idea what their passion ought to be is really hard. So I, I tried to explain to you how I found my passion and it starts from this one course. So ME310, how many have you have heard about ME310? A few of you, good. It needs a lot of more promotion here, <laughs> seemingly. So ME310 is a year-long product design uh, and development course run together with Stanford University. It's the most intense experience I've ever, uh, the second most is intense experience I've ever had in my life. And uh, it's an interdisciplinary course where you have electrical engineers, you have business students, you have uh, industrial designers, art students, you name it, working together on a real-life project. 
well, when I decided that this is my future, this is what I want to do, I was actually a student at Turku School of Economics. So I wasn't an ALTA student at the time. And I went to the, the um, Opinto Ohjaaja, what are the career counselor person, and said, this is the minor I want to do, this is my life from now on. And she said, no, we already paid you one really expensive minor at the visual arts school, we're not going to pay for this. And I cried, and I cried, and I felt like, no, why by Stanford, that was that, and all of the excitement around it. But then I decided that I'm still going to try. So I went to Laura Repokari, who used to run this project, and he's this most <laughs> adorable, wonderful man who said, oh, we need troublemakers like you. Like, we don't ask for permissions. <laughs> we just try out new things, and let's try to see if we can smuggle you in without Alta noticing. <laughs> Luckily, Alta didn't notice, and I got into the classroom, and, and later they noticed, and they approved. <laughs> and, and it's just an example that sometimes bureaucrats and, and these structures don't allow you to like experiment and try out new things, but you should still push and try and try and show your excitement and that you're really serious about the thing that you're doing. Um, so my project uh, at this Alta, uh, th at this ME310 uh, course uh, was together with the group to build a fully modular, um, fully recyclable consumer electronic product. And the 310 process is very sort of, it's a d-school project, uh, project of, of like running a design project and, and very, I think we had deadlines every two weeks to uh, return one type of a prototype. And one of the first prototypes we did was around uh, experimenting with like the concept of modularity. We took apart like a ton of different uh, consumer electronics. This is one of the prototypes where we uh, tried the idea that what if the joints of the cell phone were made with sugar and you could put the, the end of life pro phone to, to like a, a bowl of water and it would dissolve, like a horrible idea, <laughs> never do that. <laughs> Consumers definitely don't want to put their electronics into, into water to see them dissolve. Uh, we tested things out with Legos and, and with, um, with, with um, like uh, Play-Doh and, and one really interesting thing was the, the even the word modularity that was used in the product brief. So for uh, a business student, for an industrial designer and for an electrical engineer, the term modularity means completely different things. And then we ended up having these very, very intense discussions around Play-Doh, trying to explain to one another what exactly do you mean by when you say modularity. And we did this uh, like toaster that we took apart and the idea was that you could have like functional modularity as well as sort of um, yeah, functional modularity but then also like a uh, function of modularity so you could use the toaster in different ways as a grilling device. Uh, don't do this because we ended up forgetting the, the number one thing about electrical circuits. We got like that there's now double the amount of electricity going in that thing and we got like burned so many times using this device. Finally, we started to converge a little bit on the idea that we wanted to do a laptop that you could take apart. And it was this bold, big idea. And I, any industrial designers in the room, like, no, never met as hardworking people as industrial designers. Just amazing. So Juho, who was an, in our team, he spent like all nights CAD modeling this design for a fully recyclable laptop. And uh, this is one of the prototypes we did for the idea that what if you could like uh, take the keyboard out and work on the keyboard because working in cafes, wo coffee, coffee places and so forth was becoming pretty uh, popular around this time. And finally, we got the, the final product ready and we were demonstrating it in, in Stanford University. And uh, it was a laptop that you could take apart in 10 steps without any screws um, without any um, like hinges or hinges, but not like anything that you needed to use tools for. And then it had the added, uh, and all of the components were like USB plugged, so you could just take them out and and uh, like replace the motherboard and so forth. And then it had the added benefit of of being able to use the computer uh, or the like the uh, keyboard of the computer from distance. And when this project was finished, I felt like I made an actual real world thing that you could use. And it was the first time in my life that I felt like that. Until that point, I had only written reports in business school. And I felt that, wow, this is what I want to be doing. This is what I want my career to be. And this project was picked up by MIT Review. It was like in some blogs and so forth. And, and the, I think the video got like 50,000 views on YouTube when, when Autodesk, which was our sponsor, put it online. And it was also the first experience of doing something that I felt, wow, like other people like this too. This can be meaningful on, on like a global scale. 
And back to the idea of passion and sort of doing things that make you passionate. I don't think passion is something that is born in you. I think passion is something you discover while doing a lot of different things. And if you haven't yet discovered what your passion is, like most here are, my number one advice for you would be to just do a variety of things. Say yes to all sorts of crazy suggestions and ideas that people throw at you, because that's the only way you're going to find your passion. It's the finding part that is the difficult part. So star number three, starting with the hypothesis and everything else you can learn. I don't know if it's like that in university anymore, but when I uh, was in business school, I somehow thought that like people are born with these abilities and they just know how to do things. And I've realized that it's much more important to have a very strong hypothesis of what you want to do uh, in the beginning and, and many of the skills you can learn as you go. So as mentioned, I'm, I'm um, the co-founder of Rails Girls. It's uh, the first experience in software craftsmanship and that's been the uh, like tagline from day one. Rails Girls was let me see if I have, yeah. Um, Rails Girls was co-founded with me and Kari Saarinen, but that sounds really big and brave. In reality, it was me who was been study, had been studying in Stanford University, and I had taken a class in programming over there. To completely fell in love, moved back to Helsinki. It was November, it was boring. I had no friends who were excited about these things. And, and me and Kari decided that, okay, we're just gonna do like a weekend workshop uh, to teach other like-minded women the basics of programming. And here's a few key things that we did. So first of all, we didn't have a very good curriculum. The first curriculum for Rails Girls was done in like a matter of two hours. It would definitely not pass any CS professor's uh, sort of pedagogical approach. Uh, we didn't have any funding for this thing. Uh, the event was organized at Gisco Labs, which was Garis, um, uh, like a uh, job place. And I remember we did tomato soup as like a lunch thingy because we needed to feed people somehow and we figured that tomato soup is, is the cheapest option that we can do. And uh, we didn't spend too much time thinking about it. I think the first Rails Girls event was organized in roughly two weeks or so. But we made a website for it and we made a video of the Rails Girls thing. And because of the internet, it started to really spread. And people were tweeting that, hey, like in Helsinki, they seem to be doing really, really cool things. And I remember especially that guy over there, DHH on the left hand corner. Uh, he's the, the founder of Ruby on Rails, the, the framework, and he tweeted something. And I remember printing out that tweet and putting it on the wall and being like, wow, this is the best of day of my life. Like DHH knows that I exist. And then something funny happened. We got a call from Singapore from a guy, go, guy called Jason Ong. And Jason says, would you guys want to come to Singapore and do like a Ruby on Rails girls for Hello Kitty kind of an experience thing? And we didn't have project funding. We didn't have a project plan. We had no idea if the curriculum really worked, but neither of us had ever been to Singapore. <laughs> so we totally wanted to go there. And because we were students, we had a lot of flexibility in our times. We, we flew over and we organized a Railscale session over there. And now today Railscale has been or organized in over 270 cities all around the world. And a good story here is that this is like, of course, me, um, me being like wise <laughs> uh, in hindsight, but uh, I don't think this thing would have spread if we had organized the second Rails Girls event in Tampere or Kokkola or Oulu, all like kudos to those cities, amazing cities. Um, I think the order that we did things was Helsinki, Singapore, Shanghai, where we actually organized one event at the Alta Design Factory. And the morning we walked in for the event, all of the windows had gone missing and people were like, yeah, this is China, <laughs> get used to it. Um, Estonia, Germany, and then I think it was another Finnish city. So we needed a lot of momentum and a lot of people in order uh, to make the movement strong enough and to find enough like-minded people in order to do it in smaller and more sort of yeah, smaller cities and pay attention because this theme is gonna gonna like come back in my life in a few years time um rail scales 
it was never a business. It was way too expensive to be a business because we had coaches and we had volunteers who like gave us their free time on a Saturday to teach beginners programming and you could never pay them enough or make it profitable like that. And I never even wanted it to be like a like a structure or a business. Uh, when Rails Girls started to spread, a lot of the, these older, like wiser men, especially, <laughs> came to me and said, "You have a good thing going on here. You should license this." <laughs> and I'm like, "No, no, Rails Girls should be as free as the internet itself." And I think I was right. In hindsight, uh, it's this amazing community of people who keep on inspiring me still every day. But it works because people have ownership over what they are doing. And Rails Girls led me to Code Academy, which at the time was this very like small startup. They had just done Y Combinator. They had just raised a uh, million dollars of funding. I was the fifth employee. Um, both of my bosses were 21 year old, <laughs> which is amazing. I recommend it totally to anyone. And uh, the only reason I got the job was because of Rails Girls. They didn't get, care about my fancy Aalto University diplomas or my, my Stanford experience. They, they cared about the fact that I had done something at scale that they needed help in. And Code Academy was the startup experience I've had. After that, I've almost had nothing to do with startups. Uh, and it was amazing and fun and exhilarating, but it also made me miss home quite a bit. And if you're in your 20s, I so much recommend you to do the crazy roller coaster whirlwind of a startup. It teaches you emotionally, it teaches you on skills based uh, things. It's, it's a wonderful experience, but around after one and a half years, I was starting to feel a little bit like, oh, I, I miss my home and maybe this isn't the big passion that I want to be doing, even though like all of the stars were aligned to that direction at that point. So I moved to Helsinki. This is 2013, uh, fall, again, November. Again, I'm lonely. Again, I feel like no one understands me. Again, everyone around me keeps saying that, did you really let your career in New York go and you moved to this tiny, tiny village back home? And are you insane? But I had this idea. Because when I was teaching myself programming uh, in Stanford and after that, I was practicing Ruby, the programming language. And every time I would run into a problem that I quite didn't understand, like, what is object-oriented programming or what is garbage collection? I would try to imagine how a six-year-old little girl would explain this concept. And um, through that, uh, the character of Ruby was born and all of my computer science books were filled with these little doodles of characters and, and so forth. And, and that's the project I had in mind. So this project had been going on for like four or five years, but it had always been a side project. It had always been something that I, I felt that, oh, I don't want to make this into a, to like my real thing. But because I had time in Helsinki, uh, because there was not much other career opportunities and because I was dirt poor at that time, uh, I kept on working on the idea. And I think this is the thesis I really started with the hypothesis that I was talking about in advance. So I didn't really have the skills. I didn't really have the, n well, I had the network because I had Rails Girls and Code Academy already at that point. Uh, but the strongest thing I had was a very uh, sort of robust worldview and the idea that if programming is the new lingua franca, we ought to be teaching poetry instead of grammar classes. And what I meant with that is the idea that in the same way we don't learn Finnish by, by going adesivi, allativi, iblativi, <laughs> or we don't learn French by only conjugating irregular verbs. We learn a natural language by using it. We learn a language by writing really shitty poems and essays and reading contemporary books and classic books. In the same way, if we're serious about making programming accessible to everyone, we ought to have a diversity of different ways to teach this thing. So, a children's book to teach programming in a more colorful and whimsical and fun way. And I had these characters. Ruby was, of course, the heroine of the book. But then something in my brain had switched. And you know how there's people who see math as colors or numbers as colors. I started to see the world of technology as stories. And of course, that would mean that Linux the penguin would be really hard to understand, but very efficient in whatever <laughs> he was doing. And then there would be uh, the idealistic Firefox and uh, the green robots that would be many. 
and they would be very friendly, but they would be also very messy and they would grow up too fast to be reliable and that would be Google. And I went to my mom and I was like, mom, I have this great idea. And she's like, that sounds horrible. Are you making some sort of a Soviet 70s propaganda book for kids? <laughs> And I went back home and I needed to really think like, oh, what am I doing? So I figured that, okay, I need to have a more educational element. It can't be just like a tongue-in-cheek, geeky, jokey thingy book. Um, few problems. Oh, wow. <laughs> problems being that finished lies here. Well, I wasn't an author. I wasn't an illustrator. I had never written a book before. I had no experience in early childhood pedagogy and I didn't have a CS degree. I still felt like a very mediocre programmer. But I'd say, if anything, programming has taught me a lot of resiliency. It's taught me the idea that you need to make a lot of mistakes in order to understand how things work. And it's hard to see when someone is programming in front of a computer what happens in their brain. But in drawing, you can actually see the progress. So these are some of the first illustrations I did for Ruby. You can see that they are not very good, but I kept drawing. And these are some of the newer ones. And I kept drawing. And it really, really helped that I had this global RailsGirls community around me that started to imagine together with me what would a world of software look like the eyes of through the eyes of a six-year-old. And I got these plush toys from Belo Horizonte. And slowly around this time, I started to sort of have the self-efficacy, the, the belief that I can actually do this, that there's enough people in my network who trust and believe in me. And the picture started to be better. And early in 2014, I did the best and the worst thing I've ever done in my life. I decided to put this project on Kickstarter. And it took me almost four months to prepare in advance. So almost from the time I moved to Helsinki to the time that I launched the campaign. Uh, and I, I think I was asking for $10,000 to sort of cover the self-publishing costs. And I actually had done a lot of prep work and thought about like people who I'd met and who encouraged me and said that, yeah, we would totally buy a book like this. But still what happened totally blew my mind. And this is such a BuzzFeed title here. <laughs> I just realized <laughs> well, the book gathered $380,000 worth of pre-orders in, in the 30 days that it was online. And, and I became a children's book author overnight. In the first 24 hours, the book got $100,000 worth of pre-orders. And this should have been my moment of joy and celebration. In practice, <laughs> my husband came home and he was like, what are you doing? And I was under the bed and I was crying like this. I'm like, ah, they don't understand that I don't have the book yet. <laughs> I have an idea, I have a beautiful video, but I freaking don't have the book yet. This was also one of the most popular projects on Kickstarter, the entire platform, and 20% of the annual book exports of the country of Finland. And I was a first-time author at this point, who was mostly hyperventilating. Which brings us to star number four. What happens when you become an overnight success? Well, it's a lot of discipline, it's a lot of love, it's a lot of luck and it's all about endurance. Uh, every single overnight success I've heard about has put so many hours into the work that they do that it's, it, it becomes just apparent that there are no such things as overnight successes. So first, for the past two years, I've felt a lot like Alice in Wonderland, that I took the red pill and I fell inside of the computer and I've been trying to find my way out ever since. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the the bad experiences I had running the Kickstarter campaign and, and also running a company after that. Uh, but now I'm really proud to say that Hello Ruby is doing really well. It's been translated into 20 languages. Uh, there's actually a second book out already. It's about how the computers work. Um, I'm working on the third book. It's how about how the internet works and also sort of in the very early uh, planning phases of, of the fourth book, which is going to be about artificial intelligence and what should kids understand and know about that. So for the first time in my life, I actually know what I'm going to do for the next two years. And it's, it's almost scary at this point. But what I would like to explain to you or somehow convey to you is that even though you read these startup books and you read about A-B testing and you read about these massive, explosive overnight successes, everything meaningful still takes a lot of time. And if you pivot too fast, if you change your opinion too often, you're lacking a vision. And 
I at least put a lot more effort I into Jack Kerouac and his idea that you had a vision boy, a vision. Only damn fools pay no attention to visions. And if I were to take life advice, I would take them from poets instead of mathematicians, <laughs> I'm sorry to say. <laughs> so don't anticipate too fast turns. Don't make your runway too short because you need time and you need endurance to, to run your project or idea through. So this was the first version of the workbook. Um, this is what was on the Kickstarter page. And there's some things like pixel art and bug sudoku and my first error message. But those of you who are programmers in the room and are, you're scratching your head now and being like, oh, uh, what, how does this relate to programming? You're absolutely right. It doesn't. <laughs> this was the first version. And I'm so ashamed that this still exists on the <laughs> internet and that people actually trusted me and backed me with this horrible thing. But if there's anything that I've learned in the past two years, it's that you need to have the endurance and the resilience to draw a thousand circles because eventually the circles get better uh, and you get better at, at drawing. And then to sort of have the boldness and brashness to put out the first horrible version out there and, and let people look at it and, and get excited about it or, or bash it or, or whatnot. And that's the only way you can get into uh, like publishing several books and having a book with like 120 pages of, of content that is like uh, vetted by teachers and, and that is, is pretty okay already. Only way is to put out that horrible, embarrassing, bad first version. And I'm not going to read you the whole quote, but this is a quote that really kept me alive <laughs> for much of the past two years. It's from Ira Glass. Uh, he's a podcast producer, a radio personality for This American Life. And, and he says that all of us who do creative things, we get into it because we have good taste. And I think creativity here means all different disciplines, whether you're a biologist or a computer scientist or, or a teacher. But for the first couple of years you try to do stuff, it's just not that good. It's trying to be good, it has potential, but your hand is not as good as your mind. But if you remember that it's the mind that got you into the game, it's your taste that makes the thing uh, go, and you just need to practice your hand until it's there, you're going to be okay. So a lot of time I'm asked also about how do you do international things and how do you build global businesses. And I don't think I'm the right person to ask about this. I think Ilka Vanhanen has much better stories. But I know a thing or two about building international phenomenons. And it really starts with buying plane tickets. It doesn't start from waiting someone that someone else will come to you and take your hand and take you to the Chinese markets or take you to the American markets. It starts by you yourself buying the plane tickets and, and getting ready to go. And one anecdote I have about this is Japan. So when I was small, I was born in 1986, so I'm like a kid of the 90s. And every time there was something that would combine creativity with technology, it came from Japan. So Pokemon, Nintendo, Tamagotchi, and I was always in love with Japan, but I never studied the language. I never did like business in Asian markets module in, in business school. So I thought that, oh, it's like, it's a gone thing. Like I can't do business in Japan. I, I am not prone or like adept at doing it. And a few years ago, I was in Nordic business forum and I was being interviewed by Alf Rehn. And Alf asks me this question, Linda, you've done a lot of different things, like, so what do you want to do when you grow up? And one of my like pet peeves in Finland is the idea that like careers need to be so vertical. Like first you're a project coordinator and then you're a project manager and then you're like whatever and the CEO and uh, director of the board and so forth. And I would much rather have a very vertical career. Oh. Most rather I would have a constellation of a career, but the idea that like I would rather do many different things than one single thing. And I told Alf the craziest thing I could think at the moment, which was, when I grow up, I will be a kindergarten teacher in Japan. <laughs> and the Nordic Business Forum audience, you guys know it, it's a very sort of strict audience, and they were like, ha ha ha, funny thing, hehe. <laughs> but then something funny happened. So two weeks after that, I get a call from the, the embassy of Finland in Tokyo, and they were asking, were you serious about it? Would you really want to come to Japan and be a kindergarten teacher? <laughs> and at this point, I speak three words of Japanese. I know sugoi, subarashi, and kawaii, which is uh, awesome, 
are great and cute. <laughs> and with that vocabulary of business Japanese, I go to Japan. I meet a lot of people. I do a lot of playtesting in kindergartens. Uh, you can do a lot of things with free words <laughs> only. <laughs> and when the book was launched last April in Japan, it was a bestseller. It was the most sold uh, children's book in Japan for a week on Amazon and Rakuten. And the reason why it was the most sold book wasn't because the book itself was so good. The reason was that I opened my mouth and allowed other people to get excited about what I was doing and connect the dots for me and say that, hey, I'll help you here. And have you met this person? And you ought to be talking to that one over there. Same with speaking careers. When I was in business school, I was always told that, Linda, you're a really marvelous presenter, but you need to really practice like proper business communication. So please, speak slower. Lower your voice a little bit down and, and let go all of that like of all of that giggling in between. It makes you seem very like unprofessional. <laughs> but I always felt that there is this world of presenting that is that is not about the business communication that I was being taught. And and I kept talking and talking and talking in like a gazillion different events. And I had this secret hobby. Every time I came back from school, I would like take a speech from Barack Obama. And this is from the Iowa caucus in 2000, uh, 2008, uh, four. Yeah, well, anyways, uh, yeah, 2008. And I would do like speech karaoke. So I would have Barack speaking on the side and then I would read at the same time. And I would try to do like with a story from, uh, with a mother from Kansas and a father from Kenya and with a story that could only and blah, blah, blah. And I realized that Barack makes so many pauses in his speech. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how slowly he can speak. So I, I hopefully learned a thing or two. I did the same thing with poets. I did the same thing with Beyonce. And I developed this whole own way of presenting and speaking, but I never knew what good it was going to do because I clearly wasn't going to be the person who could go in a boardroom and, and <laughs> do serious business communication. But then, Two years ago, some former Alta students invited me to TEDx to, to speak in CERN. And I did that. And the TED team in New York picked up the, the speech and put it on the front page of TED. And I think it's nowadays been viewed over 1.4 million times, which is insane. Because I was just like speaking about my own experience and, and telling stories. And, and that's the power of the internet and, and connectivity and virality, that things can spread way faster than you ever anticipate them to be. Well, the story doesn't end up here, because apparently someone from the White House had watched this speech. And uh, in the beginning of October, I was in White House, invited by Obama for his South by South Lawn Festival, which was a festival for art and science and, and technology. And I was sitting there on the White House South Lawn and eating popcorn and listening while Barack Obama and Leonardo DiCaprio were discussing climate change. <laughs> and then we all turn around and there's this big canvas. It's like a house party, basically, a canvas. And we all watch the, the documentary that DiCaprio made. And I was pinching myself and being like, wow, this is, must be the most real thing in my life that has happened ever since then. So there will be heartache, I promise you that. Uh, one of the worst things I've ever done was the Kickstarter campaign because the book was a year late. I had promised it that it would deliver in August 2014 and it delivered in August 2015. I had done almost everything I could, but the publishing timetables just are what they are. And a lot of Kickstarter projects were notoriously late ar around that time and people really started to lose their trust in me. And I started to get a lot of messages that said that, oh, like you're a horrible human being, you stole our money, my kid like didn't get their Christmas present, I hate what you do. And for a year and a half, every evening, um, I would go to sleep and then my husband would two hours after that like hear me screaming from the top of my lungs like in total panic and two hours after you go to sleep that's the moment when you're supposed to go to deep sleep but my brain was just so stressed out and I was so anxious that I kept on like waking up and I didn't remember it myself but I needed to go and see a doctor about this so I promise you if you're doing something big and meaningful it can hurt and especially if you're doing something where you put your whole personality out there it will hurt I still have today like this 
uh, really like intense following on Ylilauta. How many here knows what Ylilauta is? <laughs> yeah, don't Google that. <laughs> Definitely, it's like a fortune version in Finland, and they just like bash every single thing I do. And also, like Reddit really doesn't like me. Hacker News doesn't like me. Like in Hacker News, uh, there was a the Kickstarter campaign was there, and they kept on like dissing what I was doing so much because I was wearing like a short skirt and they said, oh, like the only reason she gets the money is because she can smile and has a short skirt. But the good news was because they were like angry among themselves, it kept the post on top of Hacker News for like 48 hours and all the money came in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so sometimes internet misogyny is good. But I don't have a good answer for this. Um, I don't know how to deal with stress. Less. I'm still figuring it all out. What I would say is that don't Google yourself. <laughs> don't read other people's reviews. Try to remember the hypothesis, like why you started to do the thing that you do, and hopefully it will keep you going. I think building a product is definitely not the same thing as building a business. I struggle still a lot with the, the business building side of things. I'm really good at building products, but not really good at building businesses. And I employ myself at the moment, which like isn't representative of how much and how big the company is perceived to be. So maybe that's something that you ought to also remember, that when you look from the outside, things always look much bigger and bolder and cleaner and, and like more impressive. And then finally on risk. So how many here know Pippi Longstockings? At least the Finns in the room. So she's the world's most strongest girl who was just the most badass little role model girls in Scandinavia have when they grow up. She has these red, like, piggy tails, and I hated her guts when I was growing up. <laughs> she was absolutely too wild and too, like, she broke all the rules. And Pippi has this girlfriend called Annika, who has this, like, blonde hair, and she does things very orderly, and she's always like, oh, Pippi, you can't do that. And I was Annika. I so was Annika because I was a person who got, like, straight A's in school and, and I always followed the rules and I never liked poker and I never jumped from <laughs> airplanes and I always thought that don't the entrepreneurs like why do they take the risk like don't they feel horrible when they take the big risk and then the company fails or the product fails and, and doesn't your heart break? Well the older I've grown the more I've realized that I'm actually more like Pippi even though I don't want to be like that and the concept of risk was just weird in my head. Because if you want to really have a change in the world, you need to take risk. Because the only way you're going to get other people who are the brave, crazy, like world changers to get excited about your project is by taking a risk and, and like adding the element of risk into what you're doing. And the second thing about risk is that really like in this world and in this time, I suppose risk like the biggest risk is that nothing happens. The biggest risk is that you don't get better. You, everything is like boring and safe and, and like beige and you stick in the you're stuck in the corner and nobody notices you and nothing ever happens. And that's the biggest risk. Not that you fail or that your project doesn't go anywhere. So finally, I don't think it's about skills. I don't think about it's about education, I think it's about people. That the most important sort of stars and the constellations in my story are the people. They are my family that really rooted for me in many things. It was Karri who did the Rails Girls thing with me. It was Krista who really first saw my sort of potential. It was Miki who kept on pestering me about <laughs> all different things. It's a lot of different people and I don't have the time to name them all. But really, being surrounded by the people that think differently than you uh, is the most important thing that I've done in my career. And I'm so happy that I made the jump. And sometimes it means that you need to let go of old friends. Hopefully not. Hopefully you can keep a lot of people in, in your life. But if you're not sure if the people you're surrounded by right now are the right people for you in this life situation, go out and look for them. I still look for like inspiring people every single day and, and try to find and figure out like who are the constellations and the stars that I need in my career at this point. And then finally, I'm going to end with a small story from the technology world, because this is like what my profession is, is really rather about. 
I think the exciting people about us humans is that we contain multitudes. That's a beautiful poem by Walt Whitman. But what I perceive it to see is that a computer can be binary. A computer can be only a one or a zero. It can only be true or false. But we people, we contain multitudes. We can be many things at the same time. And, and we ought to be poets and programmers and, and illustrators and authors. And the beautiful thing about technology is that the very roots of technology are in poetry and math. The world's first programmer was Ada Lovelace, and she was the daughter of Lord Byron, uh, a notorious poet from the, the Victorian era England who had all these affairs with other women. So Ada's mom was really pissed off at her dad <laughs> for the most of the time, and she said, Ada, you're going to get a rigorous mathematical education. None of that poetry nonsense for you. And Ada did get a rigorous mathematical education for her era of a woman. And she hung out with Charles Babbage while they were building the analytical engine. And everyone else in the Victorian era England was obsessed with the idea of a, the analytical engine being a calculator. They saw the analytical engine as being something that produced a lot of different kinds of numbers like square roots and, and powers of two or six or whatnot. But Ada, because of her heritage, because of her DNA, she saw that numbers could represent logic, and with logic you can represent anything in the world. And that's why we call her the first programmer. And what made me really excited about Aalto and all of the action and work that is happening is here is that Aalto doesn't divide you into these binary classes. Aalto allows you to be many things at the same time. And and I think the beautiful thing about technology is that it's built on humanity. It's built on all of you guys who do and study and research these things. The very first computer in the world was a human. Being a computer used to be a, professor, a profession, like being a professor or like a nurse or a scientist. The computer was the person who calculated long series of numbers. And I think the very last computer in the world will be a human too. And the world technology, it includes the tools of problem solving, but it also includes the attitudes and skills and competencies, all very human things that humans bring into the equation. And we adults, we forget about this oftentimes, but the kids, kids don't. So I have the pleasure of working with a lot of kids uh, and sort of researching with them. And I ask kids to explain to me what is technology and who uses it and what is it used for? And this is my favorite answer. It's a nine-year-old little girl who says, technology is electricity that loves. <laughs> is there like a better way of saying it? And she goes, it is used to play. I use it to have a conversation with my mom. We use a WhatsApp application. And then finally, and most importantly, people use this technology. Thank you. I can tell embarrassing stories about Krista and Miki. Ha ha ha. My question is uh, uh, when you were working on your book, uh, was there some moment in your life uh, that you felt like really very challenging and you thought that maybe should I stop altogether yeah. and Absolutely. how did you come over it? Every single day. Uh, so again, like I had never done a book before. Now I can promise you that the second book was so much easier and the third book is even more easier. It's still challenging, but when you're doing something new for the first time, it's, it's going to be scary and it's going be, to be tough. And I like... I think the problem was that I didn't have like a possibility of like failing uh, like boldly because I had promised all those freaking people <laughs> the book. If I hadn't done the Kickstarter pro uh, project, if I hadn't pu put myself publicly out, I would have never made the book because it was hard work. And there were so many moments that I felt like, oh, I, I'm not like the right person to do this. And who am I to kid anyone on this? So I think making your project public is, is one way of, of like a very painful way uh, of like forcing yourself to deliver on on what you did, and then probably trying to like remind yourself that like it's it's going to be over because I always knew that there's going to be like a moment when it doesn't <laughs> hurt anymore so much because eventually the book is going to ship, and uh, that's probably 
like the way I went through it was probably because I had so many good experiences in my life earlier and I understand and I appreciate the fact that not all people have this like strong um, belief in themselves. Uh, I, I think I, I came this close to quitting and the only reason I went through was that I, I had this like uh, fairly like good idea about who I am and what I was good at and, and that my work wasn't who I was. So kind of separating the two also helps. Uh, in my presentations, I give out pretty sort of extroverted and like <laughs> joyous and optimistic view. In real life, I'm much more shy. I spend a lot of time like in my house, in my pajamas and just like being anxious about meeting people. And it helps me to separate when I'm on stage, I'm a different personality than when I'm like out of stage. So maybe that's another thing when you're feeling re really, really frustrated with something that you're working on and it feels like challenging. It helps to just box it up and say that this is work. I still am a valuable and important human being, even though this would fail. Another short question. Uh, I saw on the map uh, where is, uh, you are holding these uh, road <laughs> rail events. Uh, uh, this was a little bit distributed in a strange way. It was mostly concentrated in Europe that yeah. I can understand. But then uh, how did you pick up that uh, there were some dots in Asia, <laughs> India, maybe China also? Yeah. So accident, serendipity, it's really much run by the Ruby community itself. And there's been like Eastern Europe has been very strong. Uh, Japan has been amazingly strong, mostly because Yukihiro Matsumoto, the founder of Ruby comes from Japan. Uh, America has been less strong than because like there's already a lot of commercial uh, learning to code sort of boot camps and so forth over there. I've never had a plan for real skills on like how our geographic expansion should work. What I do wish to see is that we would have a little bit more dots in Africa, for instance, uh, because of the longest of times, I believe that our real skills is just this Western like girly thing where you like make nice things with nice piece of technology. Uh, and that like if you're in rural Africa, you should learn something serious like Java or, <laughs> or C or something that will get you employed. Uh, and then I realized after there was like the first workshop in Kenya uh, that all kinds of people deserve nice and beautiful and fun and exciting things. And, and that's one of the things that I'm really excited about is, is sort of seeing rail scales slowly start to spread uh, in Africa. That being said, I'm not that involved. Uh, I don't know even when I've last organized like an event. I consider myself to be sort of the chief cheerleader of uh, the community. So I. I still welcome every new city that comes in and try to connect them with someone like, hey, you're in Belo Horizonte, you should probably talk with the, this city or so. Uh, but it's very much driven by sort of the volunteer network. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name is Maria and I would like to ask you about um, how did your book go through all the cultural adaptations because yeah. every single culture has the unique things and how did the storytelling change mm. according to every translation and and the second question is after that um, you show some slides that you done a creational process with your fans with the sketches and stuff yeah. so probably some of the storytelling also came up uh, from from your fans yeah. and, and you were inspired by someone else so maybe you could um, tell. Uh, yeah. Does the internet work here? May well, maybe maybe I'll just give an example. So translations are really interesting. Uh, a lot of the vocabulary I use is not even like in the Finnish book. We needed to invent some of the computer science vocabulary that we used because all of the Finnish programmers would use the English term uh, to describe the phenomenon, and and it would be like hard to understand. Um, mostly the translations are done by, pu by publishers, so I have a publisher in each country and you need to negotiate with every single country <laughs> separately. Uh, so it's a, it's a little bit of a different model than the App Store model where you just put in something and it sort of grows out of there. Uh, one funny story is from Japan where I, um, I have this exercise where there's a flow chart and uh, for instance, one of the flow charts is a chart where you need to give uh, the robot instructions on how to bath, uh, bathe himself. And there's a picture of the robot next to a huge bathtub that is overflowing. And the kid needs to understand that the step that was missing from the flow chart was the fact that the, 
the robot didn't like close the tub and that's why it overflew. So my Japanese publisher calls me and in a very panic mode I said like we have a huge problem and <laughs> Japanese people always have a huge problem. So I'm like, okay, bring it on. <laughs> What's happened? And she says, we need to change this exercise. Because the steps for the robot were like this. Uh, first the robot um, like uh, opens the bathtub and then goes into the bath and washes himself and then comes out of the bath. And my publisher says, oh, no, 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 no. In Japan, people first wash themselves in the shower and then they go into the bathtub and then they relax in the bathtub. <laughs> because like culturally, it would be very inappropriate to wash yourself in the bathtub. Uh, so that's what we changed. And then in Latvia, for instance, we needed to come up with a new word for cupcakes because apparently there's no word in Latvian for cupcakes. So tiny funny little things but but the basic narrative tries uh to uh, stay the change same ah. then about co-creation um rails Coast community gave me a lot of uh belief in myself as an author um but i'd say the biggest inspiration for me is kids uh, oftentimes my process goes so that I have something that I'm interested about and I invite kids to our office and we do play testing uh, so a lot of my exercises are born from the questions that the kids ask, the things that they are wondering about, like, uh, Linda, how does YouTube know when I press play button? Like, how does YouTube know which video I want to show to them? Or Linda, like, when I look inside of the computer, what are the creatures that live there? Or like, Linda, is internet a place where you can hang out in? And, and these very sort of philosophical and, and weird questions. And, and that's really like, I feel that's a big driver for my process. Um, it's just continuously having this dialogue with kids. Um, compared to a lot of traditional book, like illustrators and, and writers, I feel like I've maybe learned from like software development to test early and test often and break like big gigantic problems into like smaller pieces. So oftentimes I'm, I'm taking like one piece of the, the book and then just like <laughs> doing story time with kids. So I'm sitting there and reading the book and then like asking for ideas instead of waiting for the whole book to be finished. Thank you. So my name is uh, Ifi Jam Kingsley. Thank you, Rutas, for sharing with us your amazing journey. It's Thank very you. inspiring. So um, I just uh, remembered when I was growing up as a little child. I left uh, Nigeria at a very early stage. And uh, most of the reason why I left was actually because uh, um, you know, there was so many d strange things around me that I don't understand. And I'm all the time trying to find out why things are the way they are, mm. where I am. And then looking at the television, I see so many different things also. So that out of curiosity and trying to understand, you know, how this world works, what happens. And, you know, that led me to, you know, to, to, to Europe. So when I look at a map that mm. you of course, someone, made the, the first uh, person that asked questions said something about, you know, there was actually in that map what I saw, which of course, within the African map, it mm. was almost blank. Mm -hmm, yeah. So it makes my heart beat. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, um, if entrepreneurship is about solving problems, wh why is it not? Wh why is there not enough sort of courage mm. for young people to actually, you know, be bold enough to go and solve? those problems Absolutely. and make the world a better place. So that's my question. <laughs> that's a pretty big and heavy question. Thank you for asking. I, I think that's a wonderfully important question. Um, I think as someone who works in the technology industry, I think a big problem of company creation within the tech sector has been that the tools to create something have been um, very undemocratic so far. So, for instance, learning to program has oftentimes meant that you need to go to university and you need to study for five years and you need to consider yourself to be like a very mathematical person and so forth. And luckily that is starting to change. Luckily, there is more and more like tools like Alt Ventures program and communities that allow many different kinds of people to see themselves as entrepreneurs and problem solvers. Um, when I work with kids, I don't consider that I teach them to program. I feel like I'm preparing them to see like 
prepare them, preparing them for a world where every problem is a computer problem, whether it's about like nutrition, energy, uh, whether it's about education, and helping them also to see opportunities uh, that technology can help and create. But I think it's a lot about the mindset and the attitude. And, and like, honestly, for me, it was very scary to go to China for the first time. And like, I'm ashamed to say that I've never been to Africa. So I should definitely go there and, and push a little bit further. The French translation of Ruby is coming out. Um, I, no, actually, it's already out. So, so hopefully I'll go with that and, and travel a little bit over. But you're absolutely right. And I think the beautiful thing here is that I see a lot of diversity in the faces looking at me which means that we'll have a lot of different kinds of problem solvers who see different kinds of problems than the sort of the stereotypical programmer who thinks about their own problems and, and solves them. So good job, Aalto. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. For and uh, I one thing. He said that all of the world's problems are computer problems. For example, your current problem is traveling. Are not. They cannot be solved with physical products. So there's a spare shirt for you. <laughs> Thank you. And then there's some candy for late dinner. <laughs> an hour and 15 minutes, so I need to run away, but if any of you have any questions, uh, please feel free to always contact me and, and I try to respond to each and everyone. Thank you so much for having me.